Hi everyone and welcome to Backstory. Reporting to you from London, I'm Dana Lewis, creator and host of this podcast. I'm an overseas correspondent formerly based in Moscow, Jerusalem before that, and I was a national news anchor and reporter in Canada. In this episode, Running Hot, COVID-19. The latest on the coronavirus emergency. At least 35 states now reporting an increase in cases. The coronavirus persists. Parents are now demanding answers about what is school going to look like this fall? What's driving the coronavirus surge in this country right now? Please, please wear a face covering when you go out in public. Health officials in the U.S. have resorted to begging residents to follow health guidelines. Trend line up, including several days last week, topping 50,000 cases. We're going to continue cases. to be in a lot of trouble, and there's going to be a lot of hurt if that does not stop. We are now having 40-plus thousand new cases a day. I would not be surprised if we go up to 100,000 a day if this does not turn around, and so I am very concerned. Nowhere is the COVID-19 pandemic more out of control than in America, where the federal government has abandoned any sensible emergency response, leaving it to individual states to do as they please. Where President Trump first said in February coronavirus was very well under control, he said recently it will just disappear. And now, he says, like AIDS, a vaccine will be found this year. The AIDS vaccine. They've come up with, or the AIDS, and as you know, there's various things, and now various companies are involved. But the therapeutic for AIDS, AIDS was a death sentence, and now people live a life with a pill. It's an incredible thing. I always say, even without it, it goes away. But if we had the vaccine, and we will, if we had therapeutic or cure, one thing sort of blends into the other, That's great news, except there is no AIDS vaccine. And the Democrats say the American president is negligent. Here in Europe, U.S. travelers are banned this summer. So as bars and restaurants reopen, planes are flying. People are relaxing after months of lockdown. And now this. More than 200 scientists have sent the World Health Organization a letter saying they believe COVID-19 is airborne and that in aerosol form, tiny particles can linger in the air for hours. So we'll talk to an epidemiologist and ask him your questions about social risks and travel and the politics of science at the World Health Organization. And we'll ask the question, are we getting the truth about the spread of the virus and what we know? For more on this, we go to Perth, Australia now to Curtin University. Archie Clements is an epidemiologist and pro-vice chancellor in the Faculty of Health Sciences there. And he was also uh, some time ago based at Imperial College in London. Archie, if I can ask you, just over 200 scientists in 32 countries have written this jarring letter. It's jarring to the public, uh, to the WHO, saying they have it wrong, that COVID is not only airborne, but lingers uh, in the air indoors. Your comment? What's very clear is that as a scientific community, we're learning more and more about this virus as time goes by. It's not a virus that we have a long history uh, of accumulated scientific knowledge. Uh, and so it is you know, understandable that um, as new information comes in, um, we, we reevaluate our, our understanding of the, the, the transmission and, um, and risk of this, uh, of this infection. Um, and yet, and yet, all these all these governments are advising us. So some are saying, stay away from two meters, uh, six feet. Others are saying, no, you can reduce that now to one meter and three feet. I mean, it sounds like people are thrashing around without very firm answers. I think people are trying to make decisions using the best available information. And as I've mentioned, the information that we're getting is continually changing as we learn more about the virus. Um, we're also trying to apply knowledge that we have from other infectious diseases. And some of that knowledge applies well to coronavirus, but some of that knowledge is um, not so applicable. And so I think it's really understandable that we are seeing variation in the recommendations that are being made. And we're also seeing those recommendations changing over time. 
uh, what we need is a, a good system for the collation of that knowledge uh, in order to build evidence-based uh, decisions. You know, the other issue that we've got, of course, is that we've got multiple jurisdictions all around the world trying to deal with this pandemic at the same time with local knowledge, local expertise, uh, and, you know, a global coordinating body, the WHO, that's trying to bring all of this information together. Uh, and that's a really challenging thing to do uh, in the current situation. Well, is it political? I mean, if the WHO comes out and tells me this is the situation, should I believe them or do I need to understand that they are compromising all the time because there are so many countries that may be pulling at them for the answers they want because why? Because they want to get their economies going? I think it would be naive to suggest that uh, pandemic decision making does not have a political dimension. Of course it does, um, largely because of the um, social and economic impact of, of pandemics on, uh, on, on communities. So yes, of course there is a, a political dimension and I think um, the WHO, of course, is a partly political organisation. It's a membership organisation with almost 200 members from, which represent uh, countries all around the world. Um, and they have to be answerable to their members. It's not a, an, 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 an independent agency that operates um, you know, of its own volition. It, it, it is answerable, answerable to all of those uh, right. members. But when they're talking about science, and this is a, these are scientific communities, one would hope that they are saying, this is the evidence, this is the answer, or we don't have it. Well, that's up to the member communities to prioritise and privilege science over their own political um, imperatives. So if the, if the member, um, member organisations, the countries that are members of the WHO, um, wish to prioritise science over their own, own political interests, then um, the WHO has a greater, greater, has greater ability to, um, to lead with scientific evidence-based decisions and recommendations. But if the member nations want to prioritise their own political imperatives over science, then that makes the situation for the WHO very, very difficult. All right, let's come back and make this very simple, because I, I don't think most people want to see this politically. They want to know, do they send their kid into a classroom where the, where the desk is three feet or six feet away, or do they go to a pub, or do they go in a tube or a bus or a plane? So I understand you are not a virologist, you're an epidemiologist, so you advise people on public health safety. We now have this debate over aerosols. What does your instinct tell you about this, the ability of COVID-19 to linger in the air? Uh, well, my instinct suggests that this virus is probably spread by droplets and that the biggest risk that you've got is being infected by someone who you're in close proximity with, who's sneezing or coughing, uh, or potentially um, talking, um, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, and, and those droplets you know, most likely will be directly transferred to you through uh, breathing or through um, contact of those droplets with your conjunctiva or other mucous membranes, uh, and that it requires you to be in, an, in a location, same location as someone, probably an enclosed space for um, a significant period of time. Um, we're not seeing, you know, the, the reproductive number for this virus is um, where in the absence of, of any kind of intervention is between two and three. That doesn't suggest to me that it's a tremendously transmissible virus. It's sort of an, an average virus when it comes to its transmission potential. Uh, I think some of the claims that are being made around um, uh, cum accumulated viral particles in the air over, over a long period of time, um, to my mind, would probably result in a much more transmissible sort of virus. So I think droplets are probably still the primary um, means of transmission. I'm not a virologist. I um, I'm looking at this from an epidemiological perspective, and of course, uh, experimental studies and virological studies may prove me wrong, but my instinct would suggest that this is a, a disease that is spread largely by droplets, um, uh, and that it is not hugely transmissible, uh, and it does require that sustained contact. So you don't think the norm would be an, an aerosol where COVID-19 would linger in the air in a room for hours or days or anything like that? No, I don't think so. I think that's unlikely. I think. Um, I think um, if, if we saw that, I think it would be, it would be, you know, we'd be seeing much more explosive transmission. Do you think that we're going to have to, if this is true, that there is some aerosol form of COVID-19 that 
may stay in a room or a, whatever environment longer than we think, then do we have to rethink what? We have to rethink ventilation systems, ultraviolet lights, classrooms, transportation, everything. Well, I think that um, plenty of countries have demonstrated that we can get on top of coronavirus with uh, the mechanisms that we have in place at the moment, uh, with um, social distancing, um, with uh, good hygiene and sanitation, um, uh, you know, with um, prevention of people crossing um, borders between jurisdictions. Plenty of countries have already gotten, gotten on top of the epidemic using those, those approaches. I don't think that we need to be completely rethinking um, our approach, uh, you know, the way that we set up ventilation systems in buildings. I think that's not feasible and I don't think that that, um, I don't think the evidence points us in that direction. I think really what we've got to do is do what the countries that have done, that, that have been successful have done, which is, you know, shut down um, uh, areas where the coronavirus is transmitting in the community, prevent people from moving between those areas and, and other parts of, of, of of the country or the, or the world, um, ensure social distancing. All of those measures have been demonstrated to be effective. Um, so that that's 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 really my position. Very quickly, why when you talk about time, uh, where, where you are in a prolonged uh, pe period next to somebody who may be transmitting the disease, why does time equal increased risk? I guess the answer is fairly obvious, but. Uh, it probably relates to uh, the dose of exposure and the um, and, and, and the the probability of exposure. So the longer that you're in close contact with someone who's shedding the virus, the greater the probability that you will get a an infective load of virus. That, that's really the simple um, simple answer to that question. So it's one thing getting on a tube for one stop. It's quite another staying on there for forty minutes. So that means in a plane. I am increasing my risk on air transportation, for instance, because a short flight versus an overseas flight. Yeah, only by virtue of the fact that you're with someone for a longer period of time, not, not by virtue of any other kind of difference between the plane and any other form of transport. Would you get on a plane this summer? Uh, I think I've, I, you asked me that question before, and I, and I said um, certainly not to go overseas from Australia. Um, uh, would I do it? Would I travel domestically within the United States? Probably not. Um, yeah, that would probably be my answer. When you see what's happening in the United States, you must be shaking your head like everybody. Uh, is the worst yet to come there, do you think? Yes, there is. And it's, it's absolutely shocking. Uh, the, the government has absolutely failed appallingly in the United States. The messaging, it, it, it's been giving the wrong messaging all the way through. Um, you know, the latest messaging around um, being on top of the virus, uh, being on top of the ep epidemic, Mike Pence's um, um, essay on that on that topic is was just so out of touch with what's really happening. I warned earlier on that the United States was moving out of lockdown too early. Uh, I also warned that by moving out of um, out of lockdown too early and uh, resuming economic activity, that the econo the long term consequences for the economy would be far worse because you wouldn't get on top of the of the pandemic. Uh, I, you know, the underfunding of public health agencies in the United States, uh, the politicisation of the um, response have all been appalling. They've all been the wrong choice. And the American people are suffering, suffering as a result. It's a real shame. In here in England, uh, on the weekend, it was Super Saturday, they called it. Pubs open. People, when you take a look at some of the video, people jammed into bars in Soho. They were supposed to sit at tables, but they weren't. They were crowded. Uh, standing up at bars, no, no social distancing. Um, w w England now is dropping its 14-day mandatory quarantine for visitors from more than 50 countries uh, on July the 10th. Uh, are we also in the UK heading for something worse? Well, the levels of community transmission in the UK recently have been much lower than in the United States. Um, so I think the risks there are possibly slightly lower. Um, of course, the United Kingdom also has a centralised national health service, uh, and I think it's much easier to coordinate um, the response by area. So what would happen, I think, in the United Kingdom would be if there is a localised outbreak, that there would be a localised lockdown, and that has actually happened recently in Leicester. Uh, so I think that the United Kingdom's in a better position. I do understand, and I've said it all along, I do understand the need for countries to um, manage the economic consequences of their public health 
response to the coronavirus. And I do absolutely understand the need to re-engage in economic activities, including, um, you know, the, the entertainment in, um, uh, industry and, and, and the like. Um, so I absolutely get that. Um, but I think that countries have to be willing when you get localised outbreaks to uh, implement rigorous local public health responses. We're also seeing that in Australia at the moment in Melbourne where we've, we have seen a uh, community outbreak of infection over 100 cases per day um, for three of, the la uh, three of the last four days. Um, and we're, we're seeing a rigorous localised response. We can do that in a country like Australia. You can do that in a country like the UK where, um, where you're largely on top of community transmission and you're really just doing fire engine work to try and shut down um, pockets of um, occurrence as they, as they, as they um, you know, as they're identified. It's a very different situation in the United States where you have rampant community transmission and that's been there all along, it's, at least since the beginning of the pandemic. There's never been a situation in the United States where there's been, where, where, where the pandemic has really, been, has really been under control at, at any kind of national level. So, yeah, I think the situation in the UK is different, um, but I, I, I do think there are risks. I think um, you are likely to see localised outbreaks as a result of uh, the re relaxation of social distancing. But, um, you know, I, I think that the UK is probably well positioned to manage that on, a, on the basis of localised responses. Thank you so much for your time. Archie Clements is an epidemiologist at Curtin University in Perth, Australia. And that's our latest edition of Backstory. As we record this on July the 6th, 2020, there are 11,419 cases of COVID-19 in the world. Deaths, 533,000 and rising. That's just over half a million people lost to friends and families around the world. If you enjoyed Backstory, please subscribe and share it so we can bring you more. I'm Dana Lewis, and I'll talk to you soon.